Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is Sweet Mash Kentucky Straight Bourbon and Rye Whiskey, made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged, and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. It's like our emails. I mean, every day we get one that's like, oh, guess what? This one's coming out and it is nine and a half years old. And (laughs) it's been sitting in this corner of this warehouse getting the north sun and it will yield about 25,000 bottles. (laughs) How's it going, everybody? It's episode 314 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, talking about the most annoying trends when it comes to bourbon releases, here's your weekly bourbon news update. It's another reminder that you need to get signed up for the world's top whiskey taster competition coming from Bardstown Bourbon Company you will compete for a chance to win a scholarship to Moonshine University, the opportunity to create your own blend with Steve Nally, get sponsored with a block party in your hometown, and a $20,000 cash prize. Sign up now for the casting call at worldstopwhiskeytaster.com to showcase your knowledge and your enthusiastic personality. Big news on the Pursuit United side of things. We began bottling last week and we'll be finishing up this week. That means we're about two to four weeks away from Pursuit United making its return to store shelves. If you don't know the story behind Pursuit United, go and check out episode 310. But United got a double platinum at the Ascot Awards and finished runner-up as the best blended bourbon in the entire competition, making it one of the top five spirits awarded at the event. So get ready to buy a bottle and maybe a backup. You'll be able to find it on sealbox.com and on store shelves in Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. Now moving on to bourbon release news. The 2021 release of Old Forester Birthday Bourbon will be from 12-year-old barrels and presented at 104 proof. This batch is comprised of 119 barrels that were filled on April 16th of 2009 and they matured in Warehouse G. Old Forester Birthday Bourbon will be available starting September 2nd at the retail shop at Old Forester Distilling Company and nationwide for a suggested price of $130. Blue Run Spirits unveils a new summer release, which is a 14-year-old small batch bourbon that will be 113 proof and available for retail for $200. Additionally, Blue Run will be distilling and laying down new fill at Bardstown Bourbon Company this year, with Jim Rutledge serving as the distiller for these specific products, as he did for last year's distillation that happened at Castle and Key Distillery. $1,000 bottles, store price gouging, and bots taking your bottles. These are some of the most annoying trends that we see today in bourbon releases. So the team gets together and we analyze what we're seeing in the current environment, and we get to air some grievances. But we always try to find a silver lining, and we try to see some positive trends that come out of this as well. Barrel Craft Spirits is always setting the bar for some of the best blends in the market, using stocks and barrels from around the world. And now you can get your hands on some right now without leaving your house. Go to BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Q on the North Side, who on the Twitter handle, at Matt Cusick, 
writes me in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm behind on my reviews of my above the char submissions. Actually, I just had so many in 2019 that uh, Matt's really good one got lost in the paper, the big giant amounts of paper that I have, or email or Twitter, whatever. Anyway, so Matt asked the questions, oh, what do I do with my limited edition bottles after I open them up? And here's the thing. This is, uh, I have a network of friends and I have a very thirsty wife who drinks a lot of bourbon, uh, probably because she's married to me and, you know, it could be a coping mechanism. I don't know. But at the end of the day, a limited edition bourbon, you know, 50 years ago was just bourbon. You know, it was just something uh, that you found in the store. You know, marketing has uh, turned it into an adventure, a hunt, if you will, of limited edition bottles. And I'm very fortunate that brands send me things. But you know what? I hunt bottles too. I buy bottles all the time. I spend way too much money on bourbon. And I don't spend money on bourbon to sit in my basement and collect dust. I spend money on bourbon so I can crack it open with my really good friends, smoke a cigar with them, and talk about whatever's going on in our lives. And to be honest with you, the past year with COVID, um, I ended up having a lot more whiskey because I didn't have my friends to to go to and drink it with. So it was a um, it, it was a time of that made me realize how much my friends mean to me and how much bourbon means to me, but. Always, my bottles are shared. The only bottles that are not shared are collecting dust in my basement for very special occasions uh, or some kind of uh, tasting that I have planned in the future that has to do with history. So everything that I have, I'd say 75-90% of it is opened and shared with friends and, uh, and family and Actually, strangers. Every now and then, I bring a stranger into my office, and we uh, we toast to the town. Then they come back the next week and want to do it again. I'm like, no, 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 no. We, no, this isn't. This isn't. That's not how this works. You know, you. <laughs> it's like a stray dog. Sometimes I feed them, and they keep coming back, and that's okay. But uh, at any rate, that's gonna do it for this week's above the char. If you want to be uh, read on Above the Char, be like Matt and uh, submit me your idea on Twitter. That's at Fred Minnick, F-R-A-D-M-I-N-N-I-C-K. If uh, if you're lucky, I'll read it in two years, just like I did Matt's. But that's going to do it for this week, folks. Be safe out there. And remember, vodka sucks. Cheers, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The boys here today talking about something as every year when it comes into release season, there becomes a time when the news starts getting a little bit more interesting. People start getting a little bit more chaotic. The lines start forming. People start hitting up their local liquor store. And it just seems that the bourbon world goes into a, a, a tailspin of, well, A, you wanted to get it. B, there's FOMO. And then C, there's this whole realm of if you do get it, what do you do with it? So. We kind of want to talk today about some of the most annoying things that we see in the realm of bourbon releases. And gosh, so, where do we start? I know, right? <laughs> there's so many. I mean, there's everything from like, so the, we'll say the first way that you get uh, any kind of inkling of how this happens is through the press release. Gosh, it seems like everything deserves a press release these days. You know, it's like, gosh, I, I can't even think of an example, but. It's like our emails. I mean, every day we get one that's like, oh, the, guess what? This one's coming out and it is nine and a half years old. <laughs> and it's been sitting in this corner of this warehouse getting the North Sun and it will yield about 25,000 bottles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, one of our limited releases to date. <laughs> but, you know, that that kind of stuff, those kind of details in a, in a press release, man, that's that's meat, right? What's not me is like the uh, the words like uh, hand picked uh, Johnny Master Distiller special crafted special crafted. You know, I, there's there's so much, and it and it has never changed. Like it's always been this way. Um, there's so much fluff in a press release, and you know, 
the audience may not always get to see these, but there are websites that just copy and paste uh, the press release and they get good views because bourbon is bourbon and the bourbon brands are one of the strongest keywords in in the in SEO world, you know. So like uh, you know, at Forbes, we get we get like instructed on how to write headlines and everything, and it and it, it all feeds into the clickbait stuff. And those press releases are filled with clickbait happy keywords, and that you know, from the trade perspective and where we sit, that stuff's annoying to me. It really is. I get I've, I've been so tired of that, and that's been that hasn't changed ever. It's like in, pop radio. It's like they know how to make a hit. And they're just going to keep, you know, beating it till it uh, stops producing a hit, you know? And it's always fascinating to see what resonates with, with consumers. Like, to me, like, Wilderness Trail doesn't put out really anything, doesn't put out a press release, and it's really well known in the, in the whiskey geek circles. But I can't, I can't get uh, Johnny stand in line for Blanton's to, you know, to give Wilderness Trail a shot. You know, when I when I'm doing like tastings, it's it's one of it's it's strange what will resonate with the people who, you know, are loosely into bourbon and just kind of hunt bottles. That's very true. I mean, when you think about I love the clickbait thing that you said. It's like, well, if you didn't get your hands in Emory T. Lee this year, you should get this year's. That's now 110 proof. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Like, there's no way that I can even try that. Yeah. So that yeah, is true. That is one of the things that and don't get me wrong. There is there is the you do have to get eyes and visibility on whatever kind of platform that you're on and you have to kind of get those people into it. But at the same time, you're all right. There are those people that just copy and paste the press release in there and it's good. It gets SEO. It helps build your website up and there's really nothing else you have to do. Like it's literally copy paste. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and it's like you go to every single Berber outlet and it's the same exact article or you're like, well, maybe this one says something new and you're like, no, nah, same copy and paste. <laughs> or then <laughs> they might have, they might have changed. Like, I mean, don't be wrong. I'm sure we all plagiarize something at some point in our life. And you're like, well, I'll change a sentence here to restructure it, make it a little bit different. <laughs> well, when it's a press release, it's for immediate release and it's for public consumption. So it's technically not plagiarism. And if you just kind of, you, you know, what, what I do is I like, I take out the fluff. So it's this price, it's that proof, it's this mash bill that was in that warehouse, what, whatever kind of real details. But the going along with what, what's annoying in these press releases, distiller quotes. Distiller quotes are the most useless things <laughs> they in the are. entire world. <laughs> even think about on this that. batch. We are, little know. clove, little cinnamon, like, okay, like, come on. They're like, just randomly pick stuff off the bourbon wheel. They're like, ah, oh, yeah, let's, <laughs> we'll throw these in there for this release. You know, they'll, they'll buy it. And one here can this is where this is where you kind of like know that I have to be careful here because we've done our own press release. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. You all have. so that, <laughs> but you know, the, to be fair, to be fair, all we did is look at it and be like, oh, well, that seems like a format that works. Like, let's go right. ahead and just copy. I that. mean, and with the amount of press that you two have been getting, you ain't wrong. We we essentially just copied whatever distiller. We're like, what do they do right? And we're just going to do it ourselves. But no, uh, so. Yeah. So when I look, when we kind of have this discussion on press releases, and I know that's just a portion of it, you know, I want to know what they think is bad. And that is where like, like Buffalo Trace, you know, we always give them a lot of business, you know, for, for building up the hype. You know, they've done a really good job of letting us know when they have shortages, but they also let us know when they didn't like something, when experiments didn't go well. Like if you remember their single oak project or their experimental series, you know, Harlan Wheatley would get in there and he's like, yeah, this sucked and that sucked, but I like this one okay, <laughs> you know? And so, like, I respect that. I respect, like, I respect when a distiller goes out on the limb and says, you know what? This one wasn't ready. We didn't like it. Uh, and Michters does this, too. Michters will say, like, this barrel wasn't ready at 10 years old. It's good at 20, but it wasn't ready at 10. <laughs> 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 Let's just have it sit for another decade and see what happens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> But you are right. I mean, there's there's some things that come in those quotes that are they're always the same. It's either like, it's either we're very proud, we love to experiment, um, all these the, the just, innovation it, at X Y Z distillery. Exactly the innovation first class and innovation. <laughs> oh my God, that word is so overused. It really putting it is. in another barrel is not innovation. That's putting it in another barrel, another barrel and another bottle. I think that's the other thing to kind of look at with this. I mean, everything that is going to come out that is a new release it's got to come in a new bottle new shape new label new story behind it because as we've seen with 
Uh, you know, with Heaven Hill, when they got rid of the white label and had to go and rebrand mm-hmm. it, I mean, everything has to go and look different to have a different consumer feel to it. And I'm looking at one of your bottles on the shelf right now, the Woodford Derby bottle. You know, beautiful bottle. You got the a painting right next to it. And, you know, that that pack that kind of packaging that has a special artist story to it. I love that. I don't necessarily want to see the cost of that artist to be reflected in the bottle. But it, when the when the when the creation of the bottle actually adds something to the to the story, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, for some of them, that's the only story they got. You know, um, you know, because the whiskey just sucks, and it always comes down to that, right? Like the packaging is like, ooh, that's so pretty, but you get in there and it's like, oh man, that's two year old craft whiskey that they should have never bottled. <laughs> <laughs> so let let me, I want to pick your brain on that. So. Like, for example, you said the Woodford or like makers, you know, it's in that they do the different waxes for different right. college teams or whatever. But like the, but what, the, the whiskey doesn't but change. But the whiskey doesn't change. Right. Would you rather see them try to do put something unique in those versus just, you know, having a different oh, wax or different ab- label? Ab- right absolutely. But I also think those types of bottles and especially the Derby bottle, they are not meant for us. They are not meant for for the whiskey follower. They're meant for the the Derby fan. And it's a special bottle to to the Derby fan. And that uh, I remember, uh, so I have a real good friend, Paul Blackburn. His, uh, his grandpappy died and he collected every single Maker's Mark bottle. And when the, the year after he passed, he's like, I have to add to my grandpa's collection. And like he had never opened any of these bottles and he just kind of kept going out getting these special Maker's Mark bottles. And he's like, Farad, I couldn't get, I, it was the... Um, I think it was a special Keeneland bottle. He's like, I, I couldn't get it. I need your help getting it. So I helped him. He's able to get it. And it was like, that's that's the kind of thing that those special bottlings from Makers and Woodford do. And we're seeing it now. Um, you know, there's a lot of other brands that are doing these special bottlings. Like we're seeing uh, Evan Williams do it for for like veterans. We're seeing uh, Buffalo Trace do it as well for, you know, for some like uh, charity causes. And, you know, when... I would like to see the whiskey to be reflective of of the bottle and to be special, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, those packaging strategies like that are, are are very different. I'm thinking more along the lines of like the Bob Dylan one, you know, uh, what, the Heaven's Door stuff. Heaven's Door. Heaven's yeah. Door, yeah. You know, that was designed by Bob Dylan. Incredible packaging. You know, you lo- you look at it and then you see the price point. I think the price point's north of 90, depending on what the bottle is. But then you taste it and you're like, you know what? That whiskey does not match the bottle. And that is, that's the kind of stuff, you know, that irritates me when your press release is all about, uh, or your marketing strategy is all about the packaging, but your whiskey does not match the bottle. And I, I, I hate to bring this one up because we talk about it all the time and we bitch about it constantly. And that's Blanton's. Blanton's, is you know I could argue that is the best package in all of bourbon. I don't think anybody's going to argue against mm, it. it yeah. I mean, it, it is a is. beautiful package, and it is it gets people in the door for bourbon a lot of times. And I and I think it's great if you can get it for that price point. But that whiskey to me does not warrant the the price gouged SRP the price gouged uh, retail prices that we're seeing out there like two hundred bucks in the hysteria in, in the hysteria behind, behind it. it. It just does not warrant it. But that package is dadgum beautiful, and I think there should be better whiskey in it. You know, upgrade the, to the gold or the straight that, from the there you that's go. the truth that's the truth <laughs> you yeah. can do that that's for sure you know the other thing about the the packaging i do like it when you change things up and you do make it unique for the different whiskeys that do come out i did think you made a really good point about how you do it differently for charities i mean i know i think like keeneland when they do that every single year i think mm-hmm. there's something that goes to charity every single year right. for it uh same thing with evan williams that'll you know goes to veterans goes to charity so there is something that that they can do is a a slight change, nothing that requires a whole team to go out and find new barrels, but instead you just call the person who makes your glass and, or your labels and you say like, hey, can we do this? And and now you have something that goes back into a, a good charity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, you're going to, uh, I, I love helping anything that we can do for charities, is, is, especially in bourbon is so important. Um, you know, I think the, some of the issues that we find with, with, with the, you know, packaging change like there are companies that will consistently change their packaging and that's a new press release or a new marketing initiative every five years. I don't think, you know, Wild, Wild Turkey, 
uh, by my estimation, I, I think they have. I think they come out with a new one hundred and one like every other year. Every other, I mean, it's yeah. it, and it, when it's not one hundred and one, it's Russell Reserve or uh, it's Kentucky Spirit, whether it's here or not. You know, I you know when when that is the lead, when you're constantly doing that and it's built in as a strategy, I th- just I just think that's a false uh, a false play. I don't think it's a good move, and I think you can hurt your brand when you're constantly doing that. I do like what Bakers did. You know what Beam did with Bakers. You know they had the same package for. 20, 30 years, and then they, you know, came out with that that they, they new modernized product. It. They, they modernized, modernized it. They modernized it and they added to it. Yeah. So, so when you when you're creating a new package, you know, you should almost add to that portfolio of that particular brand. And look, there's all kinds of strategies that go behind this, but you know, the the package is a but what they but like Booker's, they would never change that packaging. I think you would because I think people, Booker's would come from the grave and exactly. destroy the marketers. <laughs> but they had to do some because it it wasn't, you know I mean Baker's was great. We did the Baker's blind tasting. I think we all liked the newer thirteen, 13 one, year, but yeah, the yeah. older one was like not too far behind it. Yeah. But uh you know, it did take some revamping the packaging to kind of get it out there again to where people would try it again, but I'm not sure it Maybe it did. Maybe it turned some heads. So it's like, oh yes, we are now Bakers fans where originally we weren't. But maybe they <laughs> yeah, are. We weren't, we weren't Bakers fans until until they came <laughs> yeah. out with a stopper or a topper that that was about a pound and a half. That I mean, that's the uh, the the old saying of like, you know, I, I taste what you're telling me to taste. It, it's very much about the bottle. Like if you take, you know, Pappy Van Winkle, I, I am convinced that when when people drink Pappy Van Winkle at the bar and they're looking at that bottle. That they th- their brain is communicating to their palate how special it is versus oh, of the, course. versus the palate going to the brain. Now I listen. I like Pappy, especially the fifteen year old, but I I do think that that when you look at that bottle while you're tasting it, and if you are new to the game, that you you know the brain will kind of overtake your palate. Now if you spent a lot of money on it and all you can think about is the money on it. <laughs> Then you're like, yeah, I said the, the reverse no, happens too. The like, reverse happens. I know with us, like, I remember like the tornado bottle, you know, the first time I had it, I was like totally o- o- underwhelmed. I was like, gosh, I spent all this money to try, you know, 50 bucks a pour. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then like somebody sent them to an, a sublime taste test and it like smoked everything in the blind taste test. And I was like, wait a minute, I thought this sucked <laughs> because I had that preconceived notion like this is going to be special. This is, I spent all this money. It better live up to the hype. This doesn't but, taste like two thousand dollars, right? Yeah, back to what I may be going off topic here, and it, but, but it, <laughs> but that that is it is a real thing, and like, and if you were listening to music that you love, it can influence what you are tasting. That is a real thing, and w- the influences will go into your taste buds. Now, the you know one of the greatest tasting experiences of my life happened uh, in France uh, in the cellar of a of a cognac house, and you know the. Uh, Alexander pulled from a demijohn what he said was was distilled during Napoleon's time, and we tasted what was a you know forty fifty year old cognac that was distilled during Napoleon's reign. He's telling me all this, and I put it upon my lips, and I'm in this cellar. I mean, it was like you know the thing was making love to me, and it was all my I was all my body, <laughs> all your sensory, yeah, it was, yeah, all no. up. It was, yeah. It was woo, you know. I mean. I mean, how much of that was influenced uh, by by him telling me that by me being there? You know, how would I have an exp- how I, how would I have, have I experienced that cognac if I was tasting it in a bland room with no sound, nobody influencing me? So your experience, the setting, all of that will influence it. And they try to they try to bring that influence to every little bit of marketing message. And you see that it, it works. Uh, websites like uh, Uprox and VinePair, they will, they, will um, they will take that messaging and you know, have it be fed through like a bartender's, uh, a bartender's quote and say like, five best bourbons for the money according to bartenders. And it's basically everything that we all know. And it's it just, but that little, they will pull that influence in through, you know, through kind of clickbaity stuff. And it, it just keeps getting pushed out there. And I think when we talk about what is really annoying, you know, that kind of stuff is, it, it just, it gets old after a while, but man, does it work. <laughs> yep. 
I clicked on two, two today. I mean, that's just how it works. <laughs> oh, yeah. Give me a, I'm a sucker for top tens or top fives. The listicles. It's like, listicles. It's like, I don't want to mm-hmm. research. Just give me a top five. <laughs> uh, they do work. So after the bottle comes out. We learn about it. We learn about we it. Get annoyed we, about it. We see, the, we see the master distiller quote about it. Now it actually finally hits the store. Now we can all probably agree that the most annoying thing is stores that gouge and they price gouge and they put it way above SRP because- Oh, this is this this is the uh, the three tier system. You know, I have to pay this and I have to get this to get these bottles. Whatever. Yeah, their defense of it is getting gross. It, at because, this point, it's I'm kind of they were it. like, you know, they'll get on social media and like uh, attack people <laughs> for shopping at Total Wine, saying you should come to our store and pay forty percent more or something. Uh, but yeah, it totally makes business. sense. Like the distillery should make the least amount of margin and you should make the most. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like okay, the people that create and make this get a little least amount. So. Give me a break. Yeah, I, that 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 part of the game right now is really is really ugly, and I and I hope it does improve. But uh, so go keep going. I, well, I mean, the other thing is to think. I also want to say that there's there's never been something that's coming out and saying like this is the most fair way to distribute any allocated releases whatsoever. There's there's it's different ways to do it across the board, no matter where it is, and no matter what, somebody's gonna get pissed off, annoyed, and somebody's gonna be happy in every situation, right? So when we think about stores, like what are the, some of those annoying things that we see? I mean, one thing I'll throw up is, is, you know, you only get bottles based on allocation of points. You know, how much have you spent that year and you get points, which don't be wrong. It sounds good in theory, but there are ways to get around this and really kind of make it work for your favor. Mm-hmm. Because I have friends that are in, uh, you know, outside of the markets of Kentucky because it's technically not legal here. But when you get into places like, you know, uh, in Texas and one of the big chains around there, there are people that are called party planners. And what do they do? They go buy a ton of liquor every single week for parties. And so they are the ones that have tens of thousands of points to actually be kind of the first in line, even though they could probably give a shit about the whiskey. Oh, you're talking about consumers doing the purchasing to get Con- bought. Well, yeah, consumers do I, it. But, I, okay. but see, that's, that's the thing. Most consumers are at an unfair advantage. I mean, mm-hmm. You know, Regular Jane and John, they're not going to go and they're not spending $10,000 every single week to be able to go and be at the top of this list, right? So there is an unfair advantage to some of these systems too. Yeah, I mean... That one's tough because yeah. it's like you do want to reward your loyal customers, but there are going to people, like you said, that you know they take, take advantage because they are a party planner or uh, they have an office where they can say like, oh, I can just deduct all these and you know this is for my business. And then so it's like, I mean, to me, the most annoying is the, you're the first to know, you know, and and you're on an email chain with tens of thousands of people and it's like, no, I'm not. And then you got to go wait in line and that that's where I I don't like. So I'm more, I think the points are like reward your loyal customers is the way that's at least annoying to me. And the most annoying is you're the first to know to where anyone and everyone can come and no matter who, what, where as long as you get there first, you know, because you don't have anything else to do that day you can get the bottles but that day, everyone else that day that, you mean the previous night right the yeah. previous night yeah so ryan like we we're all in business you you have a um you have a you you have very in demand seasons sure You're like uh in the in the go green um let's say you are you are slammed you're absolutely slammed and you've got you've got to make a decision about what houses to visit how do you make the decision? You're going to have to tell some people they're not going to get they're not going to get their lawns treated. How do you make that decision? Sure, I mean I, I deal with this every fall when because seeding season is like a very tight window. I'm sure people love to hear about this. But, uh, <laughs> there, there's a very tight window where we, we can only seed so many yards in a certain amount of time. And so what I do is I allocate those six weeks to my existing customers that have already have treatment plans with us that are already purchasing from us and everyone else i do turn them down i say hey we're full we'll we'll try to get to you next year sorry that's 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 just the way we do it um and then there is the case where we don't have enough time for existing customers uh to see their yard because they waited to you know too long to the last minute or whatever and whatnot so it's it is tough because you do have to tell them no and uh so it's kind of different because mine's like so time sensitive, but maybe not. Um, but I do try to reward those that are already doing business with me. So the lesson here is once you're on the list, don't get off the don't list. Don't get yeah, off yeah, the right? list. Yeah, yeah, right. Sign up early. <laughs> <on the list. laughs> 
if you need seed, call me in April for fall. <laughs> yeah. That or if you're already being rewarded at your local liquor store, st- don't stop going there. Like, keep yeah. purchasing, keep going. And I think that goes a long way with, you know, smaller stores. And obviously the bigger stores have point systems, not here in Kentucky. It, it is but, a scale thing, right? right. It, it's hard to determine because if, if it's a smaller store and you've got one store and you've got, you know, your... We'll say not even a handful. I remember the days of my local store coming around here and I was one of a handful of people that used to go. And now I am one of probably 150 that Mm -hmm. I had to, has to deal with, you know, the bourbon nerd trying to get something. And I kind of gave up a little bit and that's fine because we've we've got enough bourbon to last us a lifetime for all of us. So this is just one of those things that I I look at as saying like, okay, well now we'll have a little bit of the changing the guard. And we'll let somebody else kind of take that spot or fight for it because I'm not going to deal with the the crowd at Russia. Yeah, I mean, the that's to me, that is the most annoying thing about limit releases is people camping and going out early. And I, I know that a lot of people have fun. They create relationships, you know, but uh, it's just I think I, I think that part of it can be cool, you know. If if we're if, if we're in that because I've done that you know I've I've been in the long lines I've waited out for a long time and and, and it is fun you know you do make friendships yeah, I guess I should take it back it was fun at the beginning because you're so excited about this new hobby and you're meeting new people you're trying to find out what people like what you're trying to get get into and so I, I guess I shouldn't totally discount and say it's totally annoying I guess the, the, but you get burnt out on it quickly you, I because mean, after like two or three and you're like. Well, shit! I did this three times. I got nothing. So I mean, really, the there is a real issue of bourbon burnout, and there's a lot of uh, I I think there is um, we can get sour real quickly in this prof- in the, not profession, but in this hobby, you know, because you want something, you can't get it. Someone else got it. You know, I hate that guy because he said this about that bourbon. Now I can't get it. You know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. That guy being you? Yeah. It's <laughs> happened a time poke, or poke, two. Poked himself, yeah. So but, it's a therapy uh, session for you? <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it is a, I, when I have written about this, you know, the, the um, basically the term of being a bourbon geek, it, there's like, there's a pattern. You know, we get excited. Uh, we learn. We fall in more love. We make friends. Uh, something goes wrong. We listen to the wrong person. Something happens. Suddenly we can't get something. Uh, we hate everybody. And then you try to go to another spirit and then you come back because you realize no other spirit really does it for you. Like this is sounds bourbon. just like my story, <laughs> 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 like five, six years ago. So it is the, it, it is the, um, you, you just gotta, you just gotta start a bourbon brand. You know, that's, that, that's, 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 that's the next too. step, right? Just buy you, go, barrels. you go to limited releases and then you go to rum and then you start your own bourbon brand. You can't <laughs> get your own. <laughs> you can't get all the limited releases. You know, the other thing of uh, Fred, you made a really good point. Like, cause I was one of those people I used to go and camp out for Van Winkle and BTAC and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And you did, you created a, a sort of, well, I'd say almost an alliance of sorts with people yeah. that you are with. Um, so you've got your your hunting party, you know when it's going to go, and when you know something's going to drop and you're there, you drop your stuff, you're in your place in line, and then it becomes kind of a, a good party with some buddies for the next 18, 24 hours or whatever it ends up being. Now, I will say there are two annoying parts of this. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Total Wine & More is ready for summer. They've got all your pours for the great outdoors, like their top 12 wines under $15. And raise a glass to America with a star-spangled selections of sips made in the USA. And beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. Why not mix it up and serve a brown derby or a peachy keen at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorant, like ready-to-freeze cocktail pops and fun, fizzy, hard seltzers. Lime, pineapple, and peach, anyone? So no matter if you're grilling, chilling, or both, you're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers. In-store or TotalWine.com. 
Heaven Hill Distillery just launched a 3D behind the scenes tour of their Bernheim Distillery, the largest independent family owned bourbon distillery in the world. See for yourself how they produce 1,553 gallon barrels of new make whiskey per day before it makes its way to the barrel for aging. From grain trucks to copper stills, Drop into this 3D experience at heavenhilldistillery.com and navigate your way around the distillery for a step-by-step -step look at how they craft their award-winning lineup of American whiskeys. Heaven Hill reminds you, think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. Now, I will say there are two annoying parts of this. One is that when there are new people to this sort of hobby of, you know, camping out and doing whatever, there are people that like to live and die by the sword that say, if you leave your chair, you're out of line. Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, no, nobody's going to sit in their chair for 24 hours. Like, <laughs> right. let them go to the bathroom, let them go get something to eat and then come back. Like, nobody's sitting there and like, yeah, I mean, it, that's one of the things that is kind of like, golly. So there's some people that, you know, they want to, they really want to, you know, die on that hill and, and have that be their thing. So what's, what's the time threshold that someone can be away from their chair though? I mean, like I you go it, set it up and say they're gone. An is, an hour and a half is probably fine. I oh mean. yeah. But say it's like three hours, four hours. You start, you start less well, kicking it out there. And that's, <laughs> see, and that's where the alliance comes in. Cause <laughs> <Well, laughs> you'd be like, oh no, he was just here 10 minutes ago. You missed him. Oh he, yeah. He just had to run like, and no, I haven't, I haven't left an hour and a half. And I've seen that chair <laughs> from 50 chairs back. I can see that one. <laughs> but well, that you, you brought up the serious guy, you know, you brought up the person that's there for whatever reason. Maybe they're wanting to get the bottle for something very special in their life, but they're so serious. They're not going to like have anything get in the way. And it's like, it, they're the person that if there's a fire and you happen to be just like an arm's reach of them and you're all running out the building at the same time, they're going to grab you and throw you back and like, yeah, you're going to burn now. I'm not, you know, so there is a, there, those people exist, you know, but those people also exist at sporting events when you're trying to get out of the stadium after um after the the uh, the game is over and i think sometimes in bourbon we we tend to look at we we tend to look at this this industry as if it's unique but the fact is assholes exist everywhere and like and when we can like when we can kind of compare bourbon to other hobbies or enthusiast uh, enthusiast groups and you paint it with the same picture it's like you know what we're not nearly as bad as leaving a Browns game or, no. you know, something like that. You yeah, know, I mean, you're not going to find a more charitable giving, you know, yeah. on the most part. I mean, I'd say 95% of the people in this hobby are some of the greatest people you'll ever meet. And then 95% and of those people in that line would be like, man, is everything okay? Right. When they got back, you know, held your spot for you. It's you just know? the 5% that ruins it. Well, I mean, because you got the other 5% that go and drop a chair the day before and they're the first three chairs and they just dart. Right. And they're not, they're nowhere to be found. And so the next person comes up and they post it on the Facebook group. They're like, whose chairs are these? Crickets. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're like, well, that's it. These chairs are gone. Well, we always have someone taking advantage of the system. That's just how it is in everything. Yeah. And I think, I, I really do believe that in this, in this space, it's mostly good people. Yeah. I, I think, I think just the raffle is the best way to go. You know, it takes all like fuckery out of it. <laughs> it's just like, you know, you don't have to, people working the system to gain points you don't have people camping in line you know first first, first come first serve it's just like random and it, that's and some people say it's not random because they're like oh it's fixed or you know well, this I mean, or I, that. to be fair like when i used to have time and i used to love camping out i hated when they turned into raffles because i was like i didn't mind wasting my time to sit in line and do this now that was it was also a different time yeah. when i had time to burn and go go do all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and i was like I was always guaranteed something if sure. I was there in line and I had, and I had some fun granted, you know, your back hurts the next day cause you slept in your car, but you at least came away with something versus, and sure. you, you put in the time and effort to be able to go and do it. Now, the other side of this is yes, that is, it sounds cool to be able to get that, but there are the other actors that are just there, either they're paid to be in line or anything like that, that ends up being the most annoying part of it too. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, those who are paid, you know, again, going to, going to something else. And they're not even paid. The they're like, how much they pay? And they're like, 
50 bucks. I'm like, what? <laughs> You're spend all day here for $50? Dude, when, you, when I was in college, what I would do for 50 bucks? You kidding me? Oh, it's tr- you went I to was... college a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Beers were a nickel. Yeah. I got, I could get a Keystone type Light beer. six pack for two bucks. <laughs> I'm just messing. It's true though. All right. So we got the bourbon, we got the press release. Now we go to get it. Now people have got it and they start either talking about it or tasting it or selling it, whatever, you know? Well, I mean, there's the other Hold side. Hold on, wait, did Ryan just take he charge did. of the episode he did. and keep he it did. flowing? Well, I mean- did. I if, felt bad calling no, it. No, please do, because, <laughs> I mean, it is, It is. don't be wrong, because it is annoying when, you know, you do spend a lot of that time um, and people just go around and flip it, or you found somebody that just got it for retail, just being at the right place at the right time, and then they flip it. And you're like, ah, oh, damn, dude, like- we busted our ass to try to get this bottle. I mean, I remember waiting at, it was really old, or really cold in the morning. And I think this is when like each Taylor Cured Oak came out. And I was like one of five people at Liquor Barn that day. God, that's like his dream bottle, <laughs> Cured oh, Oak. Oh, was, that's one of mine too. Yeah. And, and I just remember, you know, getting that, you know, basically being there and they were like, oh, it hasn't come in yet. But since you're the first five people here, what, were the, what was the order people came in? And I'll call you when it comes in. I was like, oh, I mean, it worked out in my favor. That <laughs> what if they're like, they did and they never called you. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I did get the call. So that was a good thing. But I mean, put in the effort to actually go and get it. And then, you know, you hear about something, another friend or another group. And they're like, oh, no, I just walked into, you know, this other store. And oh, they just had it on the shelf. And you're just like, damn it. And then they go and they sell it right away. And you're like, man, I just put all that time and effort to try and, you know, a, uh, you know, leave my wife and kid at 4 a.m. to go and stand in line at a parking lot. Right. Like, uh, that is annoying. Yes. There, therein lies the one of the w- one of the things you have to do too. You have to like not look at what the competition does, you know. And it, and I know that that's not an e- the easiest thing to do. But once you get the bottle, don't look around. Don't look like it just when you buy a car. You, the worst thing you can do is to see what other people paid for the car. <laughs> There's just you don't. You don't want to have, you want to get yourself, a, you want to buy the bottle and you want to get home, drink it, end of story. Maybe have a friend over, end of story. You know, don't look and see what other people have done or how they got it. Because th- what that will do, that will create of like, that will take away the journey, you know. And the thing is, we always talk, th- there's a common discussion of, uh, is w- what's the saying? It's like, is it, it's not the journey, it's the de- it's, is it the destination or is it the journey? To me, it, it's the journey. You know, I love all the work I have put into my career and people see where I'm at and they're just like, oh, you just woke up and had all this. They're on an ascot and in, in, <laughs> I mean, they're just like, I was like, they don't see the times that I was, you know, ba- had to, you know, basically pray that a freelance check would come in so we could make, you know, mortgage payments. You know, that's the kind of thing. I love the work that goes into things. I love to me, like, that's why I have like so much respect and admiration for like Tom Brady is because he has that work ethic and everything. And, and that's Enjoy the process. It, it's the process. And so the process of the hunt and getting the bottles, and it's very different for all of us now. But when we were, you know, back in the old days, you know, it was, it was a hunt. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that, that process for you, Kenny, that, that hurt back sleeping in your car, you know, four door chiropractic yeah. lessons. You know, yeah. I mean, there's just so many, so many great memories that you but have. <laughs> it, there is. And, you know, I, it brings back, and maybe we'll talk about this, but like when you, you do get that bottle and you're like so excited about it, but then you get on social media and people say, oh, this sucks, you know, or like it's terrible. And you're like, oh, shit. No. Oh, no. You know, it's like one I can think of is, you know, like Parker's 24, you know, we spend all night at, bourbon festival you're partying drinking then you get up early you're waiting it was like 88 degrees you're like sweating out demons and then you get the bottle and you're like yes i'm so excited then you get and people are like well i heard it sucks and you're like oh and then you try and you're like oh it does suck (laughs) (laughs) and i don't know that's that's you know but you're right we had so much fun you know the night before partying hanging out in anticipation of you know getting the limited release but that is annoying you know the beautiful thing about you know bottles that you know, obviously don't meet your palate for that particular time. Sometimes you approach them uh, a little bit later and you like them a little bit more. Your palate changes, you change and all that. So if you got a 24 year old and that one was not a good release. <laughs> uh, I remember scoring that very low actually, but like uh, there have been bottles that, 
you know, I wasn't that hot on. And I approached him a year or two later. Oh, you know what? Pretty good. So, you know, even though the even though the hunt may may end with a loss, sometimes you you rally back to it and give it and, a couple of years, try and, to And then, in. you know what, you've changed or whatever, or maybe, you know, a little bit of a mysterious extra bourbon got in there while the cork was on there. Who knows? But you, some you oxygen it again, did yeah, some, ma- some magic for you. Yeah. Things happen. Things happen. So, but, and this is, and I think this is what, like being married to a shrink has helped me personally <laughs> is, is that she's like, um, you, you can't let it, when, when you let those kind of like, uh, outside like bad, like commentary into what you do and love, it will affect you. It will affect you. It will sour you. And before you know it, you're putting all your money into a bourbon brand. And, uh, <laughs> right. you know. You're in debt. You're just hoping for four years to come quick. Yeah. And people still want bourbon. Yes. <laughs> so the other thing that we kind of also look at is with COVID, it really flipped a lot of, you know, a releases kind of upside down because you had to start turning to some things that went online. Do we kind of see as online? Is it is it here to stay? Is it annoying? Well, given the All amount right. that you have complained about it, I, I know. I mean, All right. okay. Well, I I'll mean, go first. I'll, yeah. I'll get I'll get my gripes out. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think anybody wants to hear a Kenny Coleman uh, technology bashing like we yeah. saw. <laughs> he's gonna. <laughs> I mean, my God, can he pick it apart? He's gonna smoke it. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like they don't stand a chance. No. It's like they had no idea what they were getting into. Oh, no, they were like. Oh, you mean this this old 1995 AOL program won't work on this? <laughs> <laughs> Fire up the bots. Here we go. So when we look at the online side, I understand it, it sounds good in theory, but there's some flaws unless you figure out how to make it work in your favor. And that's A, because A, there are bots. There are Those are real things when there is something that, that comes out. The other side of this is when you just don't announce anything and it just shows up randomly. Now, don't be wrong. That is... That is good for the people that are sitting there and constantly hitting refresh. I mean, I, I know I see it constantly here on the local groups and they're like, oh, Michter's 10-year rye on, on Fort Nelson website. Go now. I don't know how this word leaks out or I don't know how it happens, but there are times when uh, you know, you're know you going to be the last to know because you're not in this little special click that mm-hmm. finally, you know, either they have something scraped in the website that says when something is actually in stock because those Chrome extensions do exist. That's actually very <laughs> easy to see. You just put it on there. And anytime there's a any refresh it every five seconds, if there's a change on the website, it sends you a text message to let you know what's going on. So there are there are ways around this. Um, and so it's it's a very tough thing because I don't know if there's a difference of of figuring out how to be better at the system versus the random luck is if you go into a, a, a liquor store and they just happen to have a bottle on the shelf because they're like, hey, today we're going to go put an allocated bottle on the shelf and whoever's lucky gets it. Yeah, I mean... The bots and stuff's way over my head, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I think it's way that. over the heads of the distilleries, dude. They're just like, <laughs> yeah. we're just trying to sell whiskey <laughs> as fair as possible. But, yeah, I uh, think I think I think the distilleries have to be real careful about allowing technology into the process. I mean, what if someone with like a high level hacking ability comes in and just creates a uh, creates three hundred different accounts and buys up everything? you know, or, or something like that. I, I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of what ifs and this is such, this is still a handshake, look in the eye industry that does, that's still relatively the same as it was in the early 1900s. And I think, I think there's a romance to that. And when we start talking about doing this online, it's just not to me, just, it doesn't feel right in a lot of ways. And let's not forget, we still are in the three tier system. And this is an industry that's been fighting, um, uh, you know, l- liquor shipping. Yet it's okay for us to to like divvy out uh, allocated bourbons online. I mean, I just there's just a lot of hypocrisy in the industry when it comes to this. And I think you know, if you're going to have the three tier system, have the three tier system, and let someone who has the capability to manage online fulfillment not the distillery, you know, I just, it it just, we saw so many bad examples. We've seen so many, uh, people, uh, upset. And I, and I felt bad for old Forrester. I felt so bad for old Forrester when they had their uh, birthday birthday bourbon bourbon release. I mean, they were getting trashed, people trashing people that shouldn't be trashed. It was like, you know, it's not, it's not Campbell Brown's fault. It's not Jackie's fault. I mean, just, it was a situation and cut people slack. 
And so, but people get very angry on, I think people get more angry on, on for online issues than they do for something in person. And maybe that's the keyboard warrior effect. I don't know, but it was, it's just, I, I, I have not seen the online uh, distribution of this work out very well for the distillers. Yeah. I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I was like, one thing that annoys me about the online is that they want to say, you know, you can order it online, but only you can pick it up, you know? And it's like, well, wait a minute, that's, a total disadvantage to all the consumers that, you know, throughout the country that could have ac access to this through online, which is exactly. probably the point of online. So it's like, why well, do it online if you can't send somebody locally to go pick it up for you, you know, another person? Um, I don't I don't quite understand that because you can have a buddy, you know, go pick it up for you and then give it to your. But I know that was one annoying thing about an online release that was recent is that you have friends that got they're like They were so thrilled but then the distiller is like, well, no, lo you have to be here to pick it up. And you're like, well, I can't fly in for eight hours to go get one bottle, yeah. you know? But anyway. And this is kind of on topic. And, and I know you all get on get on the uh, Buffalo Trace barrel pick thing. Is that a pretty, oh, gosh. is that a good one? I'm glad you brought that up. You know, at first they had it figured out, but now, yeah, now I mean, there's competition. Yeah, I tell you what, uh, at first at first it, was, it wasn't too bad. I mean, we got, we had a barrel. We got a barrel for the past, I think, two to three years, every year, except for this year. Yep because they did change the process a little bit. And don't be wrong, the, the, the bad part about like the Old Forster release, the Buffalo Trace bourbon barrel release is that they blast it out there and they let everybody in the mm -hmm. world know about it. And so all of a sudden everything's gone in 0.8 seconds, right? So you have this uh, over overcrowding of people that are just wanting to get it and who knows if they even really want it. I don't really know. I mean, I, I remember for the Buffalo Trace Barrel Program, looking at some of the local groups and they're like, oh, I got like a 1792 foolproof, like, uh, do I have to pay for this? Like, I already got it. Like, I'm like, <laughs> why were you even on there? If like, you don't even know what you're doing. Yeah. So A, annoying point number one. B, I will say that this year, you know, hats off to the Buffalo Trace team. I think they actually did a very good job because we used to try and, you know, rally around a bunch of people and everybody hit the site at once, like just check out with whatever you can get and like, we'll just take whatever barrels we can get. Like, it worked out, worked out really great. So anyway, uh, they changed it this year. And so no matter what, if you were there at like, I don't know, maybe 12 PM, if anybody was there before 12, you just ended up with some random queue in line. So as soon as 12 hit, it said, you're now number 17,452 in line, but they only had like 24 barrels. So you had to be like the first 24 to actually get something. So it was more or less like a, an online raffle. And wow. I think it worked out relatively well, at least for the people that won. So if you got on before 12, you were put in randomly, but what if you got there at 12, were you still put in randomly? If you got, no, if you got there after 12, then you got put in the back of the line, but gotcha. if you were there beforehand, you just got put into this bucket and once 12 hit, everybody in that bucket got some random number. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. So That's it was fair-ish and I'll fair give it to yeah. um, it's Every, not, all of these. It's, are not, fair it's not fair because I didn't get one, right? Like that's the annoying part. No, I'm just kidding. That's yeah. uh, it's all good to them. But I think we got some good gripes out today, fellas. Well, I think yeah, I feel, also I feel better. <laughs> I also I also feel like what we did here, without really uh, intending to, is we had a good analyzation of of the bourbon buying culture, you know, and and it and it's got it got me to you know to to really thinking of like you know how can any of it be fixed, and I don't know if it ever can be. <laughs> no, because you're always gonna have winners and losers. Just like there's no yeah. perfect system for any problem. You're always gonna have winners and losers and that's just I, I think they're just we don't want to accept that most most problems have like a have like you, you it's within your grasp to possibly fix it the only really thing that can happen is if the distillers you know churned out better product or you know, more 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 product. more I mean, that's that's the more problem. better more better product remember those more better more better <laughs> but uh really let's also answer the question how is uh let's say what's it what's Rare breed. We all like rare breed, right? I think we can all concur. We, we all like rare breed. An old force of 1920. Um, we're not waiting in line for those bottles. We're getting them every day. Yep. How much better is the bottles that we are waiting in line for better than rare breed and old force of 1920? Here's the thing. You'll never know until you get it. <laughs> and so that's that keeps the that keeps the hunt and the chase alive. And that's why bourbon is the perfect product because it's... <laughs> 
ever. <laughs> you, they can always say, well, it's this special barrel or this side of the warehouse or that, this, this. It's never replicated. It was, it was exactly, kissed by the moon on the, you know, the crescent night of, of or it's this All very, Hallows' Eve. Very, yeah. very small batch, you know, where it's not the small batch, but the very, very, you know, and it's, it's the perfect product because there's so many factors that go into it mm -hmm. that you can just manipulate it one way or the other to make it special. That's so and true. And that's the beauty of it, but probably the most annoying about it too. So, well, good job, fellas. This is a, a way to kind of, as Fred said, analyze the bourbon buying Author, habits. Yep. We got it. We got our therapy session in. So, cheers, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your social media, as well as where you all get your podcast. Make sure you follow Fred Minnick as well and check out his podcast too, The Fred Minnick Show. With that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Vodka sucks. Toodles. Mm -hmm.